play. And another, another foul on board. His third for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although Jordan Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Izzo's dying for a moving screen. It's that dreaded moving screen. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn of The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhart of UM Hoops. Mm, Under 10 days from the potential start of the 2020-21 college basketball season. Dylan? Are you feeling the excitement or are you just feeling mass anxiety of whether this is actually going to happen or not? Oh, it's snowing. My coffee maker's broken and the season's a week away. I, I'm feeling good. We're going to do this. It's going to be it's going to be some kind of a season. We're going to see how it goes. I mean, it does it feels surreal that we're literally a week away. Like I usually have certain things that I right. associate with the start habit. of basketball season and this is not it. This is just not, it's going to be different for sure, but here we are. I do feel like your levels of OCD are just thrown totally out of whack by it not like starting on its proper date. I don't think I'm OCD. You know, really? I know. I think it, well, me and the listeners would probably disagree there. All but. right. I want to start <laughs> this podcast with one text message that you sent me last Wednesday. Okay. I don't remember this. And good job avoiding DJ. He looked like shit today. That's the golf writer of the year right there. That was your pre-master's take. I just want to put that on the record. Oh, man, that's funny. I I walked the practice round. This is why golf is such a weird sport. I walked the practice round on Wednesday with DJ and Rory, and uh, Rory looked amazing in every shot. Um, At one point, I watched him. He had reeled off like five birdies in a row on the front nine. And I was like, this dude is going to cook this week. Um, DJ, meanwhile, just spraying the ball. Can't find the fairway. Doesn't look like he even gives a shit. Of course, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, anyone that asked, I was like, I gotta say, you know, DJ didn't look too hot, but uh, lesson learned. And lesson then he went learned. and set the all time scoring record. I did really Augusta. enjoy your story about DJ though. That was a good read. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. It was about narratives, which you're all about need a narrative in golf because your analysis is clearly lacking. <laughs> no, no argument here. I don't, uh, I don't have a, a Ken Palm site on the golf side to kind of guide me through um, my opinions. But, uh, yeah, great week at Augusta National. Very cool to be there, but uh, ready to switch hats. Are you ready to actually focus on basketball or are you going to be I am. throwing off, off the wall takes here? You need to bring it. I mean, the season's here. This is going to be a uh, no. I'm all all in back on basketball, and uh, I do have like I. This isn't to go negative early, but like I do have this like creeping feeling of it's like you're setting yourself up for Christmas morning, knowing that you're not going to get any gifts. Yeah, that's called 2020. And you know, it's like we'll see, we'll see. I mean. I feel like we were talking in the summer and we we're like, they should probably pick a later starting date, lock in on that and, See, and and just do what it takes to get to a season. Like this kind of force feeding non-conference play and trying to have a season start right now when things seem a little or a lot. I think murky, uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So. I don't think there's, I think what we learned in football is just, start the season, leave a lot of room, and leave runway to get games in, right? I, if everyone can play a few games, it's not a big deal if a 20% of games get canceled right now. You can make them up later. You can figure it out. If you keep pushing things back, you're going to run up against the NCAA tournament, and you're going to get there and be like, well, shit, now what? We don't have enough games to actually play a tournament. So everyone play a couple games over the next couple of weeks, start getting conference games in, and then know that there's going to be – curves in the schedule i think that's the only way you can handle it right now i think Hmm. it's fair that also sounds like the logic of a man who owns his own website that's attached to a college basketball season (laughs) well it's the logic of a organization that needs to play a basketball tournament in march too so i don't know i don't know what like what what do you gain by delaying it in february there's no guarantee that everything's going to be remotely better or 
right? We don't know. True. True. So all you do is miss out on a chance to play games, and then you won't have time to play games. You can play it. I, I thought the schedule. pandemic was supposed to end two weeks ago, and I'm pretty pissed that that didn't happen. Must be listening to the wrong advice there, son. <laughs> All right, let's talk ho- hoops. Let's actually talk Big Ten basketball. We're let's talking get about into it. Big Our, Ten picks, the, the unofficial official poll. This is this is something I need to actually feel like the season's here, and we're getting it. This is good. It's a great tradition. Um, it was started years ago by a couple of old Big Ten sports writers when the Big Ten discontinued running like an actual preseason poll, like media poll, um, when the league office itself used to do it. They stopped and narrowed it down to like, here's your top three teams and a 10 man all conference team. And it was basically just to placate the coaches and make everyone feel good about themselves. But it didn't actually produce any level of like, here's a picture of preseason expectations. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So back in the day, a bunch of sports writers were just like, well, screw this. And they all did it themselves via mail and fax. And then it got handed down to Bob Baptist of, the great Bob Baptist of uh, the Columbus Dispatch, and he handled it for years, and then he retired. And uh, Adam Jardy of the Columbus Dispatch and myself picked it up from there four years ago. So this is the fourth year that we've done this. We get two writers from each um, Big Ten school, so 28 votes total. Um, we go one through 14 in the standings. We go preseason player of the year, uh, freshman of the year, and a uh, all Big Ten team. So. Um, You can find the results on The Athletic, on the Columbus Dispatch. Dylan has his version of it on UM Hoops, um, but all readily available wherever you want to find it. If you want to check out those results, they're not meant to be just for our sites. They are widely available for everyone to use. So, um, yeah, Dylan, takeaways. That's just just a barrage of takes today. I'm really excited for this, man. So I guess should we recap – the sure. results of the poll to give people go, a little flavor. So Illinois was picked to win the league, uh, 16 first place votes. Um, Iowa in second, Wisconsin in third. Both of those teams got six first place votes. Uh, then we go Michigan State, Rutgers, Michigan, Ohio State, Indiana, Purdue, Maryland, Minnesota, Penn State, Nebraska, and Northwestern. Uh what was your initial reaction when you saw the results? Um, I think we – did you pick Illinois to win the league? I did. Okay. So so my thoughts, my immediate thoughts when I when uh, Adam sent me the kind of compiled uh, results were I thought there was going to be more parity among the first-place votes. Um, like I thought Iowa was going to pick up a few more. I thought Wisconsin would have a few more and that it would almost be even amongst those three, Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Um I was kind of surprised to see Illinois have as much separation as it did. Um, I'm shocked that Michigan state did not pick up a single first place vote. Like I strongly considered voting them at number one. Um, but I, I, you just feel like forced of habit. Like some people, like someone would have just take a flyer on Michigan state. Right. Um, I was surprised to see Rutgers as high as it is um, at number five, because not that they're, not potentially the fifth best team in the league, but just out of force of habit, like people giving that level of respect to Rutgers, I think says a lot. Um, other than that, you know, I think it's pretty much. Let's, as let's go back to the top. Cause I was surprised. I expected Wisconsin to be picked first. I feel like in most preseason projections, they were there that maybe that's wrong, but I picked Wisconsin to win the league. Uh, it was still pretty close at the top, right? Like, Six first place votes is a pretty significant mm-hmm. number of votes in a po- in a poll like this. Illinois, I because I, I was shocked that they got over half the first place votes. So that just seemed. I mean, yeah. I, like I thought I it was going to be like Illinois. nine nine nine, basically amongst those three. Yeah, and they're what twenty six points ahead, which is basically the same size as the gap between Michigan State and the two and three teams, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think there's that big of a gap between Illinois and the rest of the league. Uh, I do agree that they have the highest ceiling. Uh, I think they probably – they just – they weren't as good as their record last year. Um, they won a ton of close games. I have some stats here about the Illini. But they were only, they only outscored Big Ten teams by 2.9 points per 100 possessions. And they finished, what, like 30th in Ken Palm? Those are like 
so closer where to did, a bubble team than a, a contender last year. And I know they finished a game out of first, but the story last year was they won all these close games. Uh, they need to get better. Um, and I don't know that – I think they – of all the teams at the top, they have the most reasons that, oh, I can see them being better, right? They have transfers coming in. They have talented freshmen. So I get the upside, but I don't think they're a shoe in to win the league by any stretch. Yeah, I I agree. So question, you said Illinois outscored opponents by 2.9 points per 100 possessions. Mm -hmm. Where would that like rank in the league? That was seventh last year. Interesting. Uh, Michigan State was first at plus 10 points per 100. Uh, Wisconsin was second at at 4.4. And then there were four teams kind of right in that three to four range, uh, Ohio State, Michigan, Maryland, and Rutgers. So, I mean, Illinois won big games. They have pro talent. Like, I I like Illinois. I think if there's going to be a team that comes together to be way better than anyone anticipates this year, it's probably Illinois. Um, I just like – I like the idea of new pieces because I feel like they had a thing, but they need – you need to shuffle it up, right? I get yeah. worried about picking teams like, oh, we're – like Wisconsin and Iowa. We're just going to run it back. We're going to be the same mm-hmm. thing. Well, Mm -hmm. you need to get better. You need to change. Uh, That can get stale. So that's my worry. But I think I I picked Wisconsin because I have the most trust in them kind of as a program. Um, Greg Gard maybe has a little up and down, but you know they're going to be a great defensive team. Um, I would say there's very little chance they fall out of the top four. Um, In Iowa and Illinois, I could easily see finishing sixth or seventh. So I kind of went with the safe pick with Wisconsin. That's fair. I, I, I went with Illinois because I think it's – I think in my write-up, I called it like the best on-paper team in the league, I think. Um, and it's close, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I always – I think the most dynamic guy out there and, um, like you said, highest ceiling. So – and I just couldn't talk myself into Wisconsin because um, I just don't – like I said a million times, like I don't think they were ever as good as they were last year. I don't think they were ever as bad. And those last eight games were just really good. But like, are they going to make 10 and a half threes a game and shoot 42% as a team on threes this year? I just don't see that happening. Like they have nice pieces, but are they that good? I I think they could be. I, I'm baffled by, I don't know why – no one respects Micah Potter. Uh, I don't know how Rovers Reapers got 11 no. first place votes for first team votes. And Micah Potter got one. I, I People are watching something different. I, I don't understand. Like Reavers Rovers is good. He's a, yeah. a great defender and like a solid piece. I don't really see him as an all big 10 first team type of player in, even in a best case scenario. And I think Micah Potter could be a stud and really change that team for the better. So I thought that was crazy. Uh, I I just trust Wisconsin basketball to win, what, 14 games, and they're going to be in the picture. Um, I, I don't know beyond that. Um, I get they might not have the upside. I don't know if they're a Final Four team or anything like that, but I just couldn't get there to pick yeah. anyone else. Um, so that's right. I mean, they're, they're, their, guards just, their guards don't excite me, and um, that's – Look, would you rather have the team – that shot a ridiculous 40, whatever percent from three over the last month or the team that shot, what did Illinois shoot from three all season? 30.6% all season. No, no, no. 30.3% all season. So give me the team that actually made shots one time instead of the team that we're going to count on three guys who I've never seen play a big 10 game to make them a better shooting team. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a risk, right? Um, So I don't know. That's where I come down. Where do you think Michigan State fits in this conversation? Like, do you think Michigan – do you think it's a top four or do you think it's a top three? You know what I mean? I think that Michigan's – oh, so wait, who are we kicking out of the top? You're kicking like, Iowa out? So I picked no, Wisconsin, no, no, no. Every, Illinois. I'm saying, I'm saying everyone's talking – right? So the teams that receive first place votes are Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Yeah. right? I picked so, Iowa fourth. In theory, oh, you did okay. Because I was going to say, like in theory, if you look at it, then you'd say, okay, there's if you're going to tear out the league, right? You've got your top three, then you've got a middle, then you've got your bottom. Like my question is, is Michigan State in the top tier? 
or or not. I think it certainly is and was, again, I'm surprised it didn't get any first place votes. I think we're talking about four teams. If you want to just stick to those four teams, mm-hmm. Izzo, McCaffrey, Guard, Underwood. Right. Who are you going to bet on to win the Big Ten, right? I think exactly. Michigan State would be the coach's <laughs> pick, right? Like it, college basketball is all about coaching. Uh, they have an established – program they've won the league three times in a row it'd be stupid not to consider them to win the league mm-hmm. on, on paper though like I get picking Wisconsin Illinois and Iowa but I guarantee not guarantee but I would bet Michigan State finishes above two of those teams this year um just as like a baseline um I I think there's going to be one of those top three first place teams who pick who falls and finishes closer to 500 I don't know who it's going to be but I would not be surprised at all if that happened um Michigan State, though, like, it's a pick for Tom Izzo, but there's still stuff to figure out there, right? I get, like, you can write down Watts, Henry, Hauser, Langford on paper, but we still don't know what that all looks like, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot. I mean, it's crazy just doing this exercise, how many teams lost their point guard and center and, like, have to completely retool uh, this, this year and just not really a clear answer for most of those teams who the answer is and who's going to replace all that production. Right. Yes. Um, When you look at the final results of the whole poll, who's the most undervalued team right now? Like who would you buy? Yikes. Uh, I thought I have a hard time sorting through the middle of the league. I, I expected Ohio state to be picked higher. Uh, they were picked higher in like every preseason magazine. Um, I, I liked, I picked Purdue way higher. I think I had Purdue at what? Uh, seventh. I guess that's not that much mm-hmm. higher, but I think Purdue's another bet on a coach, right? Matt Painter is the best coach in the league. They're going to be better than you think. Are you really going to say that Indiana is going to finish that far ahead of Purdue at this point? Uh, I don't think so based on the program trajectory, but that Eric Hunter injury really hurts. Um, I picked them before he was hurt. I don't know. Who do you think is undervalued? I feel like de- down the list, it's pretty fairly kind of sorted out, I'd say, right now. Right. Yeah, I mean, the only, like, maybe you could talk yourself into, like, Ohio State or Indiana being higher than – like, I picked – Purdue's ninth. I picked Purdue higher. I think I might have had them as high as anyone at six, but that's just – that's just the Matt Painter vote. Like they lose Harms, they lose no Joel Eastern. So of course he's going to go coach them to like a fifth or sixth place finish somehow. And everyone just going to scratch their head. I think that's addition by subtraction, losing Mm -hmm. Eastern Mm -hmm. and Harms, right? Like they're going to be better offensively and a Matt Painter team's not going to be bad defensively, right? He's going to have a good defense. So I, I think Purdue will actually figure it out. Purdue was also kind of the opposite of a team like Illinois where they're, record was worse than their performance. So you would expect them to kind of have a bounce back year in that regard. Um, what do you, th- you, you said Indiana, I'm not going to buy any bit of Indiana ever again until they show me something beyond true story, what I've seen. So I'm not going on Archie Island this time around. Uh, eight actually seemed lower than I would expect for their kind of final landing spot though. Were you surprised by that? Uh, yeah. I mean, usually Indiana is high just because it's Indiana. And they have a first team all Big people Ten talk guys. People talk themselves into it every every year, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> what do you think about Rutgers at five? Can Rutgers respect. win in respect an empty respect rack? on the name. Like, how much question. of what they did last year was because of that ridiculous home court advantage? What is the rack like in an empty gym? How far can you go when you're – like I, they're going to be a great defensive team. Do I think that they have the same kind of upside that Michigan, Ohio State, Indiana has? Not really. I like I don't know what the upside is for Rutgers. They're going to play hard as hell. It's going to suck to play against them, but I don't know. Fifth seems high to me, but I do think they're an NCAA tournament team this year. You like where did I pick Rutgers? Eighth. So that's pretty much a big drop. Um, who do you think will be a better team this year, Michigan or Rutgers? Michigan. Yeah, so we're on the same page there. Right. Um, it's hard. I, I mean, I'd love to see um, 
Oh, and here's the maybe the biggest slight of the whole thing, and I hadn't even really thought of this until after the fact. Um, the the kid that's coming into Rutgers, uh, whose name I'm going to probably butcher. Cliff Amarui. Amarui. Um, not receiving a single uh, freshman of the year vote. Like, there's a chance that this guy's a walk in the door, pretty dynamic figure for that team. Um, the upside on him is enormous. And, you know, I, like, if Rutgers put it this way, if Rutgers finishes fifth in the league, I think it's because this kid is going to be really, really freaking good. So, but someone has to vote for Zeb Jackson and Ethan Morton. So, how about that? I mean, I you, freshman you of the year. You can name names, man. If you're going to throw the gas, I don't. I don't want to look it up. But someone has to. Uh, the freshman of the year is tricky, right? Um, mm-hmm. Adam Miller and Christian Lander are what the highest rated freshmen. I'm not convinced. Like, there's a lot of bodies on Illinois um, that are going to play. So, like, Miller's not walking into, like, 30 minutes a game. Um, he'll play, but they have Trent Frazier. They have DeMonte Williams, who's going to play because he defends and doesn't ever shoot. Um, they have these big kind of six six wings who are going to fit in. So, there's just so much going on at Illinois. It's hard to really project him for a slam dunk role. Um, Christian Lander – Again, he's supposed to be the savior, but we've seen point guards come in as reclass freshmen, and they almost always struggle, whether it's like Derek Thornton. You see all these guys. They're coming a year earlier. It's a really hard ask. Hunter Dickinson, like at least he has the – he's going to play, right? I mean, that's a safe pick. That makes sense. Um, I think it would have been a lot more interesting if it was newcomer of the year because there are a lot of transfers who are going to probably contribute more than freshmen this year, right? So did you pick Miller? I did. Um, like, um, I just like I just like the pieces around him so that, like, I feel like he's walking into a spot that's, like, conducive to him being really good. You know what I mean? But not putting up monster numbers, right? There could be some, like, it feels like a year where the freshman of the year is someone who goes to, like, Nebraska, but they only take transfers. But, like, somewhere and just puts <laughs> up, like, 20 points on shit numbers and just – is the guy that the Big Ten Network decides should be the freshman that everyone talks about. Because it's hard to really find a freshman in the league, I think, who's going to be in a key role for a good team. Um, so so last year's freshman of the year voting was DJ Carton got 15 votes. Uh, EJ Liddell got four votes. Trace Jackson Davis got three votes. Franz got three votes. Kofi. Got one vote from yours truly, which proved to be very accurate. Uh, Jerome Hunter got a vote, I believe, from you. That's a good thing, huh? <laughs> Respect. And Rocket Watts got one vote. Who who won freshman of the year? Kofi. Kofi. Yeah. Franz was a good pick, too. I mean, he must. Well, he was probably on the if he, if he were There healthy, was an all-freshman team, right? If he were healthy all last year, he would have maybe had had it. Um. How, so you guys couldn't come up with a way to – sort out the tie and the first team all big 10 you just you went with the six team six player team yeah there was equal voting for you to come up uh, with a ranked choice system next time around coburn and well those three guys it was coburn reavers and wagner all got 11 votes next time that was last year i'm looking at the wrong one sorry jesus christ no it's (laughs) kofi reavers and that's right that's right yeah so who did you pick? On? And we got to talk about your fifth pick for the preseason first team, all Big Ten team. So, so my, you, my my team was Garza, DeSumo, Trace Jackson Davis, Franz, and Joey Hauser. You need to explain this Joey Hauser pick because you and Graham Couch are on Hauser Island right now. Graham voted? The two of you are the only ones to vote for Hauser, I believe. Okay. Well, I think I've said this on this pod before. Like, If you go back and look at his freshman year at Marquette, he was all freshman team. He was really good on a okay team, um, on a team where there was a ball dominant guard that refused to pass the ball. I don't think ball dominant does. Thank you. That does Marcus Howard justice. So like, like I think Howard could have even been better as a freshman at Marquette. Hauser. Um, Hauser could have been better as a freshman at Marquette. 
he just spent a year working on his body, working on his shot, working within Michigan State's system. He's now stepping into a role that is going to be devoid of Cassius Winston and a true-ish point guard where the offense is going to run through him. He's going to be relied on to do a ton with the ball, to shoot, to score, to facilitate. Um, He would have been preseason all Big East last year if he were still in the team. I don't think it's that unreasonable to say that he's legitimately an all Big Ten player walking into this year. Like most people over there think he's a pro. Um, I don't think it's that controversial of a pick. I mean, it's still a guy who averaged 10 and 5 for a average team. I get like a transfer sit out year. As the, as the third option on the team. So, like, do you really think he's Michigan State's first option this year? Like, will he lead the team in scoring? This I wouldn't year? be surprised. I mean, I assume you think that if you picked him on the first team. I mean, I, I think he could average like 16 a game and Rockets averages 14 a game and Aaron Henry averages 14 a game. Sure. Is that that unconceivable? <laughs> I, it's, it seems particularly high on him. And obviously it's hard. Like you haven't seen, like we haven't seen him play in two years. I think sit out. I trans- watched him in are- practice last year. Yeah. And so like, and he, so how good? he was really good. Okay. He was really good. <laughs> he was um, with the scout team and he was really good. Who? Like he would have played, he would have played 28 minutes a game last year on that Michigan state team and been really good. I th- so been pre- and probably would have been a preseason all Big Ten guy coming into this year. I think that's tricky because last year's team was set up for him to play kind of the perfect role. I sure I think he has like from what we've seen of him, right? So what we saw of what he's done on the court, we have stats to back up. Whatever else, now he's going to be asked to do something differently. Like Michigan State last year, he could have been a stretch four who did a little bit of everything, but really played off of the other pieces, sure. right? That's different than, like you say, he's only been the third option and he's played on the scout team. Now he's going to be, if like to be a first team, all big 10 guy, he's going to be the first guy in the scouting report, build a whole game plan around him. That's like a big leap, right? It's no well, joke. Well, hold on a second though, but let's, let's reverse engineer it, right? Because here's the other people that I was considering. Cause if I didn't go with Hauser, I would have in order, my consideration was probably Kofi, who for him to be an all for him to be a first team guy would need needs to be like absolutely dominant because you know there are a lot of pieces around him and maybe he will be and it's really hard to get two guys from one team on the all big 10 team and i mean it's it's possible last year i believe Cowan and Jalen Smith were both first team and and Maryland won a share of the championship but so it was either going to be Coburn Micah Potter, I'd say probably either like Marcus Carr or Aaron Henry. I'm not going to pick Marcus Carr because they're going to win seven games in the league. Aaron Henry, I need to see it, right? need to see him actually be a um, shoot first, score first type guy, you know, ready to kind of take on that that role. Um, so why not Hauser? Why not, why not make a, a gamble on, on something that, yeah, is unknown, but all, all I see is potential. Yeah, I mean, I get the logic picking him over Henry, who just doesn't have, I guess, kind of the disposition to be an all-Big Ten guy from what I've seen. Right, mm-hmm. like he's not going to go put up – I'd be shocked if Aaron Henry's averaging like 16 points a game, right? Like he's just not really in that volume role, or at least he hasn't been. I I just keep coming back to Michigan State. Like if Joey Hauser's the – if first team all Big Ten guy, then you should have picked Michigan State to win the league. I think well, you know I think what I mean? I'm second. Okay. And second. Okay. Well, that's second, fair. Second to, me, second to me is also like, you know, a share. I, like, I think Michigan State could absolutely have a share of the championship this year. I think that Michigan State feels like a roster where there's a lot of guys who seem like lock second team all Big Ten type guys, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's just interesting to pick Hauser, who's been a complimentary guy his whole career, to take that leap before we've seen it. Um, well, his whole career. I mean, he played behind – it was Marcus Howard and his brother were ahead of him as a freshman. Yeah, but I, I – he, like, he was also like a top 30 recruit in the country. All right. I, 
I just needed to see it to believe it. And I, I think just, it's crazy. I just, feel, I just feel the hate train over here about on Joey Hauser. I'm very surprised. I think Hauser's a way better pick than Reavers Roovers on the first team. Like, how did we pick the wrong Wisconsin guy? I don't that, I, that I don't get. I mean, I, I really – I had to talk myself out of Potter. Geo Baker got six for first team votes. That's crazy. I mean, it's tough. It, let's go over. Where's your team? Let's. let's just, my team is pretty generic. Garza, Dasumu, Trace, okay. Coburn, and Franz. I I don't feel good about Kofi. So I like. I so, get so, the idea then, of going somewhere to else. Use, to use your logic, if you vote Dasumu and Coburn both on the first team, and you don't pick Illinois to win the league, yeah, I should have picked Potter. But <laughs> that's what I'm realizing. That I think that I think if Wisconsin's going to win the league, Micah Potter's going. I should have gone all in with it, just like you should have picked Michigan State to win the league if you're going to pick Hauser on the first team. I yeah. should have backed it up with my first team Micah Potter pick because I'm shocked you only got one vote. Who voted for Micah Potter? I hope it's someone smart. Uh, David Jones. Indeed. David Jones, who has had some very controversial picks on, <laughs> on this, in this poll over also the years. Also had Aaron Henry on the first team. Like, I have a, I can, I'll buy that Joey Hauser has a better path to being a first team all Big Ten guy than Aaron Henry. I just don't see that in Henry's DNA. Do you? Like, did you consider Henry for your first team? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think he's going to be pretty good. Um, I, I, yeah, I think he's going to be like a – 14, six and three guy. So he's going to be a second team, all big 10 player. Were you surprised to see Franz Wagner on the first team? I've been reading. No, I was happy that people are paying the big 10 and no one ever mentions Franz Wagner. It's, it's mind blowing to me. (laughs) Am I off base? Tell me if I'm wrong. uh, These are two different conversations. First of all, I, I was encouraged to see that, Franz was actually on the first team here because, I mean, people are paying attention. Um, uh, on the national level, though, I mean, I haven't been looking at these things, so you would know better than me. But, yeah, I don't know how it's possible for him to be overlooked unless, like, maybe maybe Michigan was so kind of far out of the national conversation over the last month of last season, right, where people just weren't paying attention to what he was doing when he was finally playing – and and was healthy, you know, um, but that's the only real logic I can come up with on why he, but not being mentioned, like what? it just seems to be like I think he, I don't know, I'm just worried if I'm getting like out ahead of my skis, hyping him up in a little bit of Archie Island situation, but I feel like he's going to pretty clearly be Michigan's best player and have one of the better pro prospects in the league, right? I'm not missing something, am I? I mean, I think if you talk to any NBA scout, they would say that he's going to be one of the five best players in the Big Ten this year. Yeah, Him and Joey Hauser, right? Um, exactly. <laughs> so I think what's happening on the national level is people look at the standings from last year, and Michigan finished 10-10, and 10 and a bunch of teams finished 11-9, and 9, so they're like the eighth-place team or whatever, and people just kind of skip over Michigan, even though they finished higher in Ken Palm than everyone's favorite, Iowa. We haven't even talked about Iowa. Do we need to talk about Iowa? Sure. Do you just want to say the same? Should we, get, should we just get out the tape from past episodes when we talk I, about Iowa? I need you to tell me if they are going to be uh, – like how far can this team fall? That's a, let's get to the good stuff. Like are they a top four team, 500 team? Like, I, th- I think they're clearly a top four team. Clearly? Clearly a top four team, yeah. So you would take Iowa to finish ahead of basically all those teams in the middle? Yes. No, no way. I, I think Iowa's going to finish around 500 in the Big Ten. I just don't I, – I don't know. They're going to be the exact same team they were last year when they finished 11-9. and nine. Why are they going to be better this year? I, I mean, they do have a guy who's going to average like 26-10. and 10. And I know that they don't play defense, but they also do score a lot of points. And go around the league and say and try to find that many teams that you can see putting up 84 on a night because that's what I was going to do. They have a chance. Uh, I mean, if if Wieskamp can play the way that I think he can, and if they get pretty good guard play out of Bannon, Frederick, whatever, like – 
and my boy Tucson. Tucson. <laughs> Hold on. You want to find a team that can put up 84 points. No one can unless they're playing Iowa. That's the problem, right? Like, yeah, but the, but all Iowa has to do is win 84, 82, which it which it can do. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, mean, you say that they're they're going to run it back. I mean, that's that's fine. They did go, they did share. They were what tied for fifth last year. Big fucking deal. They were eleven and not, and that's not a top five. Like they're this big shot team that everyone's picking to win the whole thing. I just don't get it. Like Luka yeah, Garza but- had he can't really have a better year, right? Like he had one of the best statistical years you can have. He's not going to just pencil that in again. And that's a great season. He's going to be first team, all American player of the year, whatever else. So what's going to change around him. That's going to make Iowa not terrible on defense. Jordan Bohannon coming off multiple hip surgeries. I have no idea. I've said it before. I think Wieskamp can be a lot better than he was last year. That's not unreasonable. Um, and saying that you're going to be a top four team in this year's Big Ten is like, it's not that amazing of a overshot. Like, as I said, like in my little blurb I wrote about Iowa, I was like, they probably have a better chance of getting to the final four than they do of winning the Big Ten. Why? Because when you, the way that they play and shit like that, like you can reel off four wins in the, NCAA tournament against teams that just don't know how to play against Garza and don't know how to play against Iowa's style of play, right? But them actually going and playing 20 Big Ten games and winning 15 with that defense, I would bet on the – I'd bet on the – if I had to pick one of those two things to happen, I would take a Final Four run over them actually winning the Big Ten. Yeah, I just think if you put – this, if you just played this season on a neutral court right now, I don't think they'd be favored by – much against all the middle tier teams in the league, right? Like if like they're in this, they're not that much better than Ohio state or Rutgers or any of those teams. Well, You don't know that because for as much of a known that Iowa is, that you claim Iowa to be, I, Ohio state's equally unknown. I mean, like I know like, they have a better I feel like, coach. Like, a, like a Rutgers, Iowa would be like a better comp. of. Yeah, like, sure. I just think that if you were like trying to make odds, so you're going to say they're a consensus top four team. I just think they're more like the teams that are in the five through nine range. Uh, I, okay. So I don't see a clear separation there in that regard. Um, and they'll be good. They're going to be must-see TV. I think they'll whoever they play in the non-conference is just going to get flattened. They're going to win a couple games like 110 to 70. <laughs> uh, but then they're going to go to play at Wisconsin or at Michigan State, and they're going to – lose the games they always lose i just i don't know like that they're gonna be that much different um i agree i mean i picked iowa to finish third i probably should have put wisconsin ahead of them but like yeah i i think they're like a 12 and 8 team in the league yeah okay which i think is gonna be more middle of the pack than Mm -hmm. consensus top four i guess that's what i'm getting at um i think someone from that middle group breaks into the top four i don't know who um who, who would be your top candidate? My top candidates for that would be Michigan and Rutgers. God. Yeah, that's I, honestly, I'm not going to count out Purdue. I yeah, I mean, I have Purdue six. That seems right to me. What's the worst Purdue's finish in the Big Ten? It was probably last year, but then every other year they're right in the middle of everything, right? I mean, yeah. it's Matt Painter just knows how to win in the Big Ten in a way that I don't know everyone else really does at this point. Yeah, I mean, the Eric Hunter thing that's got to kind of concern you a little bit, though. It does. Uh, but, again, six to eight weeks from two weeks before the season starts, he's not going to miss that much Big Ten time. Yeah, but you don't think. just walk back from a broken tibia and just be fucking rocking and rolling ready to go. Fair. I don't think. I've never had one. Dr. Quinn on the on the case here. <laughs> um, can, we, let's talk, can we talk about the bottom? Sure. So uh, – the bottom is Minnesota, Maryland, Nebraska, Penn State, Northwestern, in whatever order you want to put them, right? Um, of those teams, how when we are talking on November 17th, 2021, how many of those teams have the same head coach? I 
I I hope one, but probably two. Yeah, I think there's a chance it's one. The I mean, Hoiberg's the one. Hoiberg's the one, right? I don't. I I can't see Northwestern firing Collins after this year. But I'm as down on Collins as anyone. So, but that that's tough. Uh, I. I kind of think Minnesota has a sneaky chance to be better than their pick this year, which could help them. But then I just come back to the fact that they had a generational talent at center and were still shitty last year, even though they should have been better. But, like, you look at the pieces and they seem better than maybe some of these other teams around them. But then you just come back to Patino. So, man, it's tough. So you think one also? Yeah, I mean – I don't yeah I just don't see it happening for you know let's put aside covid and the and the um financial situations of these athletic departments right um because that has to carry some weight but as football's already proving like teams will fire guys <laughs> and still take these payouts which is completely insane but uh nonetheless yeah I mean Penn State's going to go and hire itself a new coach Turgeon I don't know I mean I don't know if last year's being canceled was good or bad for his long-term <laughs> status at Maryland, because they did win a share of the Big Ten Championship, and they weren't able to lose in the second round of the NCAA tournament. So win-win. Um, but he needed to win some games. He needed to. It's still just going to be the same narrative around him because he didn't have the chance. Maybe that was the team that won. Right, but at some point, like at some point, I think Turgeon should jump, not the other way around. Jump where? Mark Turgeon can get a job that pays him about what he gets at Maryland right now somewhere else. That is a fact. If, if when uh, state? Texas moves, when Texas moves on, yeah, Wichita state, when Texas moves on from Shaka smart, I think Turgeon will be involved there. It makes perfect sense for him to be the one to go get a new job and not wait to be fired. Imagine being some fan base reading your coaching hot board and seeing Mark Turgeon's name at the top of the list. I mean, you've seen coaching, you've followed coaching changes in college basketball, right? This is not that. I, I can't imagine people like being excited to hire Mark Turgeon though. I mean, the guys won a lot of games. It's just, and it's, look, if people are celebrating your departure, it's not a great situation. It's happened before and it'll happen again. Um, so that's Maryland. Um, yeah, Richard Pitino, I don't – at this point, you know, it's kind of a big shoulder shrug there. Like they, they're not they're, – they miss on kids from, from in-state. Like, you know, his whole – the whole thing with him was supposed to be like he would keep the best kids in Minnesota because he's Richard Pitino and he can recruit that way. Well, that Richard hasn't Pitino happened. Richard needs to divert his entire salary into the Team Sizzle – grassroots program and try to convince Chet Holmgren with everything he's got to come to Minnesota or that'll be the last straw right there. And that's not going to happen for the record. There's no way that that's happening. So, (laughs) but that, that could be the final blow. Right. Uh, And Chris Collins Collins at Northwestern, like I think it's done. It's 13 and 45 happening in the big 10 since they made the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And where are they going? You, you you can do the uh, you can do the old Michigan football argument of if not him who and who do you hire that can do any better? But I mean, so he just gets to be a lifetime coach because he made one NCAA tournament. I just don't know if anyone really cares enough to like true move on at this point in life, right? I it's not the time to make the move. Probably he's he's been recruiting well, like he's getting good players. He, at some point there needs to be results, right? Like it's, it's surreal to see Northwestern go and land like a four star to every couple cycles, right? Uh, it just doesn't translate on the court. Can we talk about Nebraska? Are you ready for, for Teddy Allen? Uh, scored 31 points a game in Juco last year. Used to be at West Virginia. This is just the Fred Hoiberg special. There's going to be one of these guys every year. Uh, there, there are some dudes there, right? I mean, Trey McGowan's, they also, parlayed that transfer into his brother who's a five-star recruit Mm -hmm. uh is this the year nebraska wins games after january 7th uh i would guess no but like but also at the same time like i think hoiberg is going to win at nebraska right so at some point he'll have guys that 
make that possible. But when he brings in the players that he brings in, it's just a total guesswork. Like there's never any, re- he's what in year three. Mm. Year two. two, right? Three. No, this is his second year. Last year was this his is, first year. This is his second year. So, you know, his method of like not actually building like a program as opposed to just being kind of an island of misfit toys. Um, like it worked at I like we know it works, but at the same time, like when he he had some guys who were actual like three and four year players, didn't he at Iowa State? Event um, a few like Monte Morris, right? But yeah, exactly. how do you get from point A to point B? Like he took kids who had red flags and baggage at Iowa State and made them into a good team. Like right. at some point, people probably said the same thing about Iowa State, and then all of a sudden they were winning and looking good, right? Yeah. I mean, Teddy Allen was the top five JUCO player in the country, went to West Virginia, played on a good team. Like he, he seems like he should be good, but when you just take all these guys and it's like, uh, like, right. How, w- when does the light flip, right? Like, how does that work? Like Cam Mack, he wasn't the deal, but at least he just moved on from Cam Mack and it was like, let's try something else. It's just, right. it's hard to buy into the way he builds his program until it works. And then we're all going to be like, well, of course we should have known that guy who scored 30 points a game in Juco was going to be good. Sure. Uh, and so I don't know. You're also like, and it's Fred Hoiberg, like Duke and coach, they know what they're doing. Like, this isn't just like, it's not some total random shit show. Like, he is a good basketball coach. Um, but like at the same time, I'm like, there should be a happy medium there, right? Of like recruiting actual guys, building an actual foundation of things. And then you add pieces that, that you need um, as opposed to just restarting. Like, I hope he doesn't like, I hope that this isn't the plan where you just restart every year with an entirely new team. Like that doesn't work. Um Shit, well, look, you know, like, Cal, Cal does that at the highest level at Kentucky, right? And when was their, their last Final Four? It's been a minute, you know? Like, it's really hard to just do this over and over and over again. So, I know it's only year two. What it's especially say? hard when you're dealing with transfers who are leaving for whatever reason, right? Right. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. The, I mean, he's he's got McGowan's coming in this year, and then next year he'll have his brother. So, like, if – that could be more of a foundation. Like there's very few returning players on a roster a year after the entire roster turned over, which is a bit crazy to look at. Mm -hmm. Uh, My biggest worry with Nebraska is point guard. Kobe Webster is really good. I used to, I remember watching him in high school, but he's really small. He was at Western Illinois though. That's a huge step up to be a starting point guard in the big 10. So like, I get that he's not going to shoot you out of every game like Cam Mack, but right in a sort of, high octane spread offense like Nebraska runs that would be really interesting to see how he translates overall it's crazy to me how few proven point guards there are in the conference um Mm -hmm. just going through the list Demetri Trice uh you obviously have Marcus Carr but man a lot of point guard turnover with Cowan Simpson Winston so many guys moving on it's going to be interesting what that means for kind of the overall tone of the league i think and also I mean, look at it this way sorry go go. no i was gonna say look at it this way like going through all of the first team going through all of the votes of guys for our uh first team all big 10 the only like actual guards are desumu marcus carr geo baker langford got a vote i don't know how that happened Demetric trice Watts got a vote. That's it. Everyone else, it's bigs and wings. And last year's team had like probably all point guards almost, right? Like if you look at what was last year's preseason first team? Hold on one second. Probably had three point guards on it. Here it is. Uh, last year was Winston, Stevens, Desumu, Anthony Cowan, and Caleb Wesson were the first team. And then the Simpson vote getters. was probably sixth. Vote getters were, yeah, Simpson was the first one out. And then uh, also Nogel uh, and Geo Baker had a vote. I respect referring to Nogel as a point guard. Well, I mean, he's a guard ish sometimes. So, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, do you think that means the Big Ten is going to be maybe worse than everyone expects this year? Like, I feel like the narrative nationally I mean, is the Big Ten is going to be the best league, one of the better 
top two leagues in the country again. And I have a hard time really seeing it. I don't know. I feel like we, I feel like you and I lean toward seeing the deficiencies uh, first for, and forget what the rest of the country looks like when it, we, when there's statements like that. That's probably true. Um, just because we're so familiar with right. teams, we don't know right. who the hell. But like, if, I'm sure if we sat happened. here and wanted to really break down the ACC, we'd be like, "Oh, the Big Ten's clearly better than this." That that makes sense. Uh, I just feel like last year, like there's not a clear top ten team for me in the Big Ten. Um, top ten nationally? Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, would you be that shocked if three teams ended up in the top ten at the end of the year? No, I think there's clear top twenty teams. You could probably put half the league in the 10 to 20 range. Um, yeah. I think it'll be really interesting how that plays out in sort of a weird COVID abbreviated right. season where you don't know what sort of non-conference games you're going to get. You have teams like Michigan who are playing basically no one in the non-conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, that'll be fine if other Big Ten teams win non-conference games and you don't lose those kind of rinky-dink games, right? Like Michigan can't afford to lose to – UCF or NC State because sure they're not going to have really chances to make it up in the non-conference. Um, and what if Big Ten kind of falls on its face and whatever games they do play that are high profile, you're not going to have the same chances to make it up. But then at the end of the day, for all we know, the NCAA committee could just kind of make shit up on the fly and just pick the teams they want to make the tournament. I have to imagine they're going to side with high majors over mid majors more than they ever have when they get around to picking that. That sounds right. And like the other thing will be teams that don't have full schedules. You know, there's going to be like, I don't know. We're seeing it in other sport. You know, we're seeing it in football. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I just don't know what this is going to look like. Um, the number is what? 15 to play in the NCAA tournament right now. 14, and or, fi- 14 or 15. They already came out and said that they'll be open to granting waivers if teams don't make that number. Yeah. So basically, they're going to just put teams in the NCAA tournament based on criteria we've yeah. never well, really I mean, seen. Look, look if, if if Duke gets hit with like two COVID outbreaks and then has games that it was supposed to play canceled on it and ends up the season playing like 10 games, they're still going to put Duke in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> yeah, and I just – I can't see any mid-major getting that benefit of the doubt, right? Like – no, I think you know. What I mean, I you need old, old St. Joe's is going to need to go about twenty-two and zero. I think to get ah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you have teams that are. Pl- I, I saw. I don't even remember who it was, but one team's playing the same team six or seven times in the whole season. I think. Yeah, was that like Boston U and Holy Cross or something? They're just yeah. It was them. Holy Cross. It's smart if you're a mid-major. You just want to get games in. What else are you supposed to do? Do you think we'll see? I just it's there's so much uncertainty with the whole thing. Uh, I assume that teams might be more or conferences might be more strategic at the lower levels of like they can nominate anyone to go to the NCAA tournament, right? So mm. if like you could just say cancel the conference tournament and make a regular season champion go stuff like that. So it'll be fascinating how all this plays out because there's going to be so much uneven. Man, that's Holy Cross. <laughs> plays Boston U six times. They're projected to go lose every game they play all season. That's tough. <laughs> Can have a six team, six game sweep. That's an interesting point you make about the, uh, that these leagues can still at the end of the day, kind of put forward whoever they want. Right. I can't imagine every league has a full conference tournament at this point. There's no way. So there's no way. Like, <laughs> It'll be like the electoral college where you should vote for. It. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna see some wild tiebreakers. Who knows what? Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, but we're eight days away. It's kind of exciting. Do you, like on a scale of one to ten, how excited are you? I have one more question before we get to that. No crowds. Who does that hurt and help in the Big Ten? Um, I'll say Rutgers, Indiana. And Purdue are probably hurt the most. I would say who's helped. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking uh, about this. Like, no- Northwestern doesn't have a home crowd anyway, so does it really make a difference? Like, 
I don't know. I wouldn't say anyone's helped. That's doesn't make any sense. I think it'll uh, create more momentum, positive. Penn State will be very comfortable. (laughs) I think you'll look at teams that go through a rough patch. I think it'll just get worse. I think you kind of see this with Michigan football, right? Like you don't have the crowd to like bring you back, right? So you don't have that home game landing spot. And I think teams that are like seasoned veterans who just like are ready to show up and play, I think they'll just kind of churn through it. Like last year's Michigan team would have been great in this sort of deal, right? Like they would just show up on a neutral court and pick a team apart. Um, they, I, I, I don't really see a team like that in the big 10, probably Wisconsin. Um, but Wisconsin has always had such a great home court advantage. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. I'll say this because of how disjointed practices are, you're going to see who can fucking coach and who can't too. And you're definitely seeing that. I think, uh, in some other sports, like if you don't run a tight ship and if you don't have like institutional organization within your program, you're going to get pantsed. I think in this, in this current setup where, uh, you know, like the way that Matt Painter runs his place, the way that Izzo runs his place. Like, I feel like they're kind of built to maneuver the unknown and they're built to really um, kind of keep their, like a level of um, organization. Right. Mm -hmm. And other places, other places that like run maybe a little fast and loose or don't kind of have that, that really sound structure and don't have player buy-in of um kind of your role and blah 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 it's gonna it's gonna go bad fast i think i'd put wisconsin in that category um just because of how experienced they are and how system driven they are right like i assume that the 13th guy in wisconsin's roster is doing the exact same thing as michael potter or whatever right like right. i just feel like they probably pride themselves on sort of being replaceable their one knock there is their Depth is all really young. Um, so that could be like if you have three guys out with COVID or whatever else, that could be an issue. I think it's interesting how Michigan's really experienced. Um, they have guys who just know how to probably adapt to things faster than maybe a bunch of freshmen, like a really young team. But again, new roles, a lot of moving pieces there. But if you're going to say like it's basically like a G League team where you're just going to go out and play, like they could probably take a game plan and do something with it more yeah. than a really young team. The other, the other thing when, it, when with the COVID conversation to, I think, keep an eye on is going to be what guys, because I think this is inevitable, where you're going to have guys that get games on tape, then maybe their team gets shut down for, you know, two or three weeks, and do, do you guys come back? If you're a legit pro, if you're Trace Jackson Davis, right, and you just ball out, for the first five or six games of the year. And then Indiana gets shut down for two weeks, whatever. And there's all this uncertainty and there's games being canceled all over the place. How many of these guys just walk and say, you know, I'm just going to go into training and get ready for the draft. I don't need to be doing this. I got games on tape, you know, Franz, you know, I, I, of course, Franz, I, you know, is showed a level of buy-in in in Michigan by returning this year. But if he goes and just crushes for the first month of the year, Michigan gets shut down. Does he really need to come back? I think the big difference, like we're seeing this a lot in football, right? Like teams that are one and three or whatever, and guys are just, all right, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to go prepare for the draft. The NCAA tournament's a real carrot of motivation in a way that football just isn't, right? You don't have guys ever opt out of the NCAA tournament. You have guys opt out of bowls all the time. It's The postseason is so much a part of what you play for that I think sure. that'll be a little less common. Um, if there's, but if, you know, I'm sure that in mid to late December, early January, we're, we're still going to be sitting here saying, is there going to be an NCAA tournament? I mean, come on. <laughs> yes, but I, I think it'll be, I don't think there'll be any, if they're playing games, there's going to be an, like, you're not going to opt out if the season's still going on, right, for a two-week – so, like, right. a two-week shutdown. I'm not saying, like, I'm expecting a bunch of guys to do this, but I'd be pretty stunned if nobody does. Yeah, I think it'll be – but, again, there's just so many fewer – there's only so many first-round picks, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's not like in football where a guy could be a third-round pick and it's still, like, a valid reason to opt out. Uh, there's few guys who are going to, like, have done enough to say, oh, I'm going to be a – lottery pick now i'm gonna shut it down right like we saw that last year without covid with like uh like there's been guys who do that but i don't know it 
like Anthony Edwards last year, that would have been the kind of guy who would shut it down. Playing on a shit Georgia team that's going nowhere and not going to make the NCAA tournament. Right. Oh, well, of course, they'll opt out. Cade Cunningham, uh, they can't even go to the NCAA tournament. But, again, those are just so one-off. I can't see, like, I don't know. Like, Trace Jackson Davis, he would have to go into, like, protective help if he opted out of Indiana's season when they were, like, on the bubble. Like, come on, that's not going to happen. Well, I mean, I was just picking his name out of a hat. You know what I mean? Like, a, a, guy who's a, a guy who's a legitimate first-round talent who, if he just goes and, you know, is averaging a double-double and says, all right, well, I'm just going to go, you know, put in work. I don't need to deal with this college bullshit. This is stupid. Yeah, it would have to be, I think, a case where the NCAA tournament is basically out of the picture, right? Yeah. But maybe maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I, I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's putting a lot of faith in, in, in people. But, um, I mean, this thing's going to be a crapshoot. Uh, who knows what to expect? But let's just hope they get it in, man. Um, because I know everyone wants to watch college basketball. so I, I hope everyone wants to watch college basketball. I'm a little worried that they actually don't, but we'll tackle that at a later date. Yeah, I'm not ready to have that conversation. <laughs> so, all right, we got to call it on this. We got to wrap. So, uh, Dylan, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing it, and we will be back early next week, I think. We got games next week. We're going to have to talk about something. Oh, my gosh. Games. Wow. Um, I got to get ready. Um, <laughs> your head out of the sand right trap over here. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks, dude. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening. Be sure to tip those bartenders and servers. We'll see you next week.